Well, this line didn't work out quite as I planned because what I was going to say is that in a shell, with, that's a normal gift. And in fact, we found out that what this what this team really needed was a new coach's launch. So this is actually, you know, there are names on all of these cruise shells, but this is the first time that a name has ever appeared on a coach's launch. And I hope it'll be a new tradition so that 10 years from now they'll all be named. Um, the uh, cost of a, of a coach's launch, purchase price, Plus maintenance for expected life of eight years is thirty-seven thousand five hundred dollars. They don't come cheap. But I learned in this process of talking to Tony that if you could raise a hundred thousand dollars, that you could give a launch in perpetuity, so that when this one wears out, there'll be another one. So that was that was our goal. I'm not going to tell you yet how we did. <laughs> Coincidentally, I was cleaning, cleaning out some of my paraphernalia, and I came across, I was, I'm a pack rat, I came across an editorial in the, the tech, the school newspaper, from 1959. And they were bemoaning the fact that no crew from MIT, freshman, junior varsity, var, no crew had won a race since the 55 lightweights. Now they were really making a pitch for this boathouse we rode out of a thing down there which was about to fall into the river. But the point that caught my eye was that MIT had won a race since 1955. But what this person who wrote this editorial didn't know is that the class of 63 was about to arrive. And things changed. I do want to emphasize that it was five classes, but it turned out to be a really magical time for us and for MIT crew. Do you agree with that, Ken? It really was. I'm going to do this. Okay, so, um, it was actually Murray Morton who rode in the sixth seat in the freshman heavyweight crew who first suggested that we should dedicate this to our coaches. It was a fantastic idea. This was a year and a half ago. You may have forgotten that that was your original idea. But that's what we've done because there are three men, three men that I'm going to say changed our lives. They really did. Uh, across the full lightweight squad and the heavyweight squad, there were exactly two men that had ever rode before. The rest of us today, the term is walk-ons. So we had three, three coaches who were literally starting from scratch. Now these three men, they not only told taught us to row, they taught us a few other things. They taught us that we didn't have to be afraid of the guys up the river. The idea is that they're going to be afraid of us. And that happened, didn't it, Ron? It really did. But most important of all, I think that these three men took a bunch of boys, and by the time we graduated, we were men. And I am permanently forever dedicated to Dick Erickson, Jack Fraley, and, and Garrett Short. Gary to us. Short. And I want to just talk a little about about each one, and I hope that I, I don't want to go too long. But Dick Erickson is probably the least well known of any of the three because he was only here for three years. If I, if I mentioned the name L. Ulbrichsen 10 years ago, I'm guessing that there would be about two of you that knew who this man was. But with the book, The Boys in the Boat, everybody knows that L. Ulbrichsen was one of the most successful coaches in the history of American rowing. And he was at Washington from the late 20s until the early 60s. 
But he was, he was in my research on this subject, he was asked a question which coaches don't like to be asked. But he said, which was your, question, which is your best crew? And evidently he paused and said, I want to narrow it down to three. Well, of course it had to be the 36 Olympic gold medalists. That was a given. But there were no seniors in that boat. And he implied that the 37 crew, captained by Jim McMillan, our Jim McMillan, was actually faster than the gold medal crew, but it, it wasn't an Olympic year. And then he surprised a lot of people saying, he, he says, we can't forget the 1958 crew that lost to the Russians at, at the Grand Challenge Cup at Henley and went to Moscow and whipped them on their home course. And the man that rode number two in the 58 Washington crew was our Dick Erickson. Uh, Dick was an understudy for one year under Obertson, and then just as Bobby Mock and Stub McMillan came to MIT, somehow it was arranged that Erickson got the signal, go east, young man. And we were the beneficiaries of Dick Erickson coming here in 1959, the same year we did, as our freshman coach. What a great guy he was. So he followed, he followed in the footsteps of Bach and McMillan, but he kind of left his own imprint because in his very first year, the freshman, class of 1963, finished second in the IRA. The IRA in those days was, was in a great big uh, lake. There were no peaks. So you had 15 crews lined up across the water that included Cornell and Washington and Navy and uh, Washington. And our guys finished second. That had never been done before, and it's never been done since. I don't know who won that race, but what I do know, Navy. Navy wins the race, thank you. But what I do know for a fact is that the MIT freshman, coached by Dick Erickson, beat the Washington freshman by over a length. And you've got to believe that, that Dick Erickson's heart jumped out of his chest. So, we're really lucky to have, I believe, four. Uh, they're all still here. Four of the men that rode in Erickson's IRA boat in the spring of 1960. Ken Anderson, could you come up? I want you guys up here. <laughs> Murray Morton, come on up. Ron Cheek, and Jim Latimer. Now we did, we had an unusual situation on our hands because uh, we had a guy named Elliot Bird who was our manager and managers I don't know what the, uh, what they do today but managers were much more than just launch drivers yeah. <laughs> and Elliot made life easier for the coaches and Elliot was with this team from the first day of the freshman year till he graduated and he switched to be a lightweight, smart decision, when he was a senior. And so I want to have Elliot, who was behind the scenes with these guys, I want to have Elliot come up. I just saw Elliot. Where is he? Oh, where he ought to be. <laughs> Going on around, we're going to we're going to do more about this a little bit later. So it it was no surprise, frankly, uh, that Dick Erickson left after uh, three years because a man named uh, Al Overson was about to retire, and the 
just got the call from the University of Washington. He went back there and coached the freshman for a couple years. And when he was handpicked by Al Albertson to be his successor. And uh, Erickson, no surprise to these guys, was an amazing coach at the University of Washington. And unfortunately for all of us, uh, he passed away and he was only 65 years old. So this is a memorial presentation to a really great guy. The man that we, the man that we all know, of course, is Jack Fraley. Jack entered MIT as a freshman in 1940, and he's probably the only man I ever met who was coached by both Bob, Bobby Mock and Stub McMillan. And he stayed involved in MIT rowing until he passed away in 2016 at the age 90. There isn't an award in rowing that Jack didn't receive. He's in the Rowing Hall of Fame. He was on the Olympic, Olympic coaching team for the USA men's team for 1968 and the 1976 Olympics. The more I read about Dick, uh, Jack Fraley, who I thought I knew very, very well, I just said, Sam, wow. Jack was the man. And if there's anybody you can say is the number one person identified with MIT crew over many, many years, he's, he's the man. I want to uh, I just introduce the guys that happened to, to row in that, uh, you know, IRA boat. But Jack did some other things. First year as a lightweight coach, they won the lightweight national championship. Elliot. Took the crew to Henley, where lightweight rowed in the Thames Cup, and they won the cup. Came back, finished second the next year in 1955. And to their credit, the athletic department said, we want you to go back and bring that cup home again. They go to Henley, and they beat the team that beat them in the nationals. And that is just a great story, I think, especially as a lightweight guy. But the, I think the most, uh, <laughs> I don't need any more notes, okay. <laughs> I need to keep track of the ones I have. Uh, but I think the most uh, famous victory under Jack's leadership was none other than the 1962 Compton Cup victory over Harvard and Princeton. And Bob Kurtz, come on up, member of that crew. Most of these guys already. And one of the keys to success of MIT rowing is that we had depth. We have 100 guys turn out for crew. And if it weren't for the third boat pushing the JV and the JV pushing the varsity, this wouldn't happen. So I want to have Ron Young raised his hand because he's taking pictures. But the missing is Bob Johnson. Bob, come on up. So these are the these are our representatives uh, so far from the uh, from the MIT heavyweight group. But with a certain bias, more than certain bias on my part, I saved the best for life for last. <laughs> I was I was in lightweight crew from my first step into the boathouse until the day I graduated and even after that. And there's one gentleman whose name is on this chart twice. He's on there officially, Garrett W. Zwart. But he, he was known to us right here. So when I went out to ask people to contribute to this effort, and some of you know that I can twist. I can twist an arm. Uh, uh, I went to Gary Schwartz, and he he didn't know at the time that the thing was going to be named in his honor, and so that's why Gary is on the chart twice. Uh, Gary, could you come up? A big hand for my favorite man.
<coughs> Gary arrived in the fall of 1958, a year ahead of us, we guys, just to get a master's degree in architecture. But he didn't. What he didn't know is that Dick Bausch, who was the director of athletics at the time, knew that when he was a junior at Dartmouth, that he coached the freshman lightweights, and when he was a senior at Dartmouth, he coached the varsity lightweights. So they nabbed him, and unbeknownst to him, but because it was an exciting period of time. Gary Coach just coached here for 11 seasons. Freshman, the first freshman crew was the class of 62. They finished fifth nationally. Doesn't sound too hot. And MIT Shell hadn't even made the finals at this freshman for 10 years. The second year, which was my freshman year, we finished third in the sprints. And in the third year, class of 64, Gary's 1964 lightweights freshmen were national champions. That was the, uh, that was the first time that it ever happened. Uh, I think it was the last time that ever happened. But was there any surprise that the next year, Gary just made varsity a lightweight coach, no surprise at all. So he had three groups of freshmen that he had coached in years one, two, and three. And he built a varsity boat around those three classes that were co-national champions in his first year of coaching. It was really, uh, and I, I want to tell you, that to, to, be a, to have been part of that crew, it just, it's just a lifetime experience. You never, you never forget a stroke. <laughs> uh, okay, so he was he was promoted, and I want to emphasize that in that first varsity boat, there were three sophomores, three juniors, and three seniors that he picked out. But the depth was super important. So I'm going to introduce all of the members of that entire squad that I. I know we are here. I hope you're here. Rick Metzinger. Come on over, Rick. Road three in the, in the 63 varsity. Jack Glenn. Jack was, uh, Jack and I were only, only four people that went from the first step into the boathouse until graduation. Uh, we, so there were four of us that did that. Harvey Vines. There's Harvey. Now you'll be re you'll be relieved that I'm almost done, but I had to save the best for last uh, with with a certain bias. But in 1963, Gary coached the varsity lightweights to the, I had to create a word, to the winningest record of any crew in MIT history before his time or after his time, six to three lightweights across six races. One crew finished ahead of us and 17 finished behind us. So you could say if this were baseball or something. We were 17 and 1. And remarkably, the, the JV was also 17 and 1. So we have a season here of a man that beat 34 crews and only lost the two. Of course, we'll never, and I, we'll never forget those two, right? And uh, we were beaten in the Nationals by Cornell by six, six feet. There was no question that MIT and, and Cornell were the class of lightweight rowing because the third place crew dressed in crimson shirts with H's on them finished two and a half lengths behind MIT and Cornell. So it was a loss, but it was 
It was bittersweet, more bitter than the sweet. <laughs> now, by the time of the 50th reunion, we had decided that we didn't lose to Cornell by six feet. We only lost to him by four feet. And I want to announce the day of the 55th reunion, we only lost to him by a foot. <laughs> and if you'll come back, if you'll come back to our 60th reunion, you're going to actually find out that we won that race. <laughs> 36 and 0. I, th I think I've introduced every one of the 36 people that contributed to this fund. I think I've introduced all but one of you. If I have forgotten you, please raise your hand. I know I was looking for Herb Lyson and a couple of others. Uh, but I think we got them all. And at this time, uh, Gary, would you like to say a few words? Okay. I worked with a, a uh, acoustical engineer who said the first thing you do when you meet a microphone is to see how you do without it. Can you all hear me? No. Yes. <laughs> okay. How did you know to say no? <laughs> Can you hear me better now? Yes. yes. Um, I have to say about Dick Erickson and Jack Fraley um, that they're responsible in very large part for our success, my success. I've come to believe in collaboration that you can do a lot more when you do it together and when you're trying to do it all alone and be a star. Uh, Dick Erickson and I coached together for, he was here three years in common, but we coached the freshmen for two years. Um, and I remember we started the season with about four weeks in the barge. And we would do that together. I'd like to think that, that I had some strengths um, that he didn't have, and I know he had strengths that I didn't have. One of the really big things about Dick Erickson that I think he did very well was teach people how to pull hard. And one of his, one of my oarsmen, but who was trained by Dick in the, in the barge, and then for the rest of the year we kind of did that job together, was a fellow by the name of John Barton, who was on the, on the spring winning crew a couple years later. John Barton wrote on the board one day, that board in the front of the old boathouse where the lightweights met, the note said, the harder you pull, the harder your hardest will be. And I have not forgotten those words, and I wouldn't be surprised if a variation of them lives with a lot of you guys here. I really, I miss Dick. I saw him last about two years before he died. It was, you know, he was the same Dick Erickson that I always knew, um, and I miss him. Jack Fraley, <coughs> I met in 1954 when we followed the uh, Eastern Sprints in Princeton, um, the varsity race, and we were in Jeeps, where the, the coaches were in two Jeeps, and they followed on a towpath, for those of you who rode at Princeton. Um, and uh, <coughs> we came to the finish line, and uh, MIT 54 crew finished first. And Jack, I was in the front Jeep, and I turned around for both to look at the boats and to look at the Jeep behind us, and Jack Fairley was sitting in the back of the second Jeep, and he jumped about as high in the air as you could possibly do from the back of the Jeep. But anyhow, and I think his words were something like one word, something like yippee. <laughs> anyhow, I coached with Jack the whole time I was here. We started together. Jack left after 55 and came back, and we started 
Um, in the fall of 1958, um, and Jack started coaching the freshmen, uh, but before the end of the year, before the end of the fall season, he was coaching the varsity. We were both, some, you guys who rode with either one of us know that we were both fairly competitive. Uh, we had, the, the lightweights always had a hard time getting a heavyweights to row against us. And, and I remember trying, and occasionally we won. Anyhow, um, I coached together with Jack, and he was my boss. Um, he was a boss, that was his title. Uh, and he managed to do that to run the boathouse and, and uh, three other coaches. Um, but he was a real mentor. A mentor, I think, for all of us, and I know for me. Um, and he never used the boss, and I knew that. He knew that. But he never, ever told me what to do. He said occasionally, very occasionally. might consider doing such and such. It was always, almost always, a good idea. Um, I learned from Jack, I learned about, about how, to, how to be a boss without being a boss. Um, I was a better architect for my 11 years coaching with Jack, and no doubt about it. And I miss him, miss both of those guys very much. Uh, Gary was very gentle. He didn't talk about the past. And we, we did it with the heavyweights. <laughs> it was almost as much fun as beating Harvard. Not quite as much, but almost. Uh, one, one of my notes I forgot to say is that we have Stud McMillan here for 20 years and Jack for all those years. But the coach who won more races, who coached more winning races for MIT over 11 seasons, is sitting right here, the winningest coach of all time. And I was, I don't want to be too corny, but I want to say that I was blessed, absolutely blessed, to be a member of, of Gary's team. A couple more introductions. Uh, somebody, some people think this stuff happens by magic. But in, way back in the beginning, I met a, a, a young woman uh, relatively new to MIT, who helped me immeasurably. And this presentation wouldn't be complete if I didn't introduce Candace Crabtree. Candace, could you come up here? MIT, 
Uh, we weren't fortunate to have women rowing. Come on up, Polly. I knew from reading the, the monthly and quarterly publications, Burn the Blade, that this was one very special lady because the women's program here is, is just flying high. But what I didn't know when we came to the boathouse and I actually met Holly for the first time day before yesterday, that I was, I was meeting an Olympic gold medalist. She was on the U.S. national women's team for six years. And of course you wish every year was an Olympic year because that's the big deal. But they won the 1984 Olympics. It just, it just blew me away. So we're asking uh, Holly to say a few words, and we haven't told you yet whether we made the goal, but she's going to talk to you about that. I'm going to try without this. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, first, these are all the people that made this launch appear. Um, I can't thank you guys enough. And here is the final number, 122,910, 88. I know, but I'm not telling. Thanks, Bob. So I got to know Bob a little bit. And um, I know how much this meant to him. He's been very nervous. He's been very emotional. It means so much to him. And I wrote something very short, and I hope it captures what this launch means. The unsung hero is the coach's launch. Through thick and thin, it carries its rider. It's the coach's trusty steed. A place of privilege, the launch pulls up alongside its relative, the shell. And instantly, the synergy between coach and athlete ignites, the electricity flowing between them. Coaches Erickson, Fraley, and Gary <laughs> respected the intimacy of those side-by-side -side moments. They were reflected back to you, the good, the bad, the ugly, <laughs> always respectful of your vulnerability as a witness one. Thank you for giving MIT crew this unsung hero and for the privilege of riding every day because I am the person now who gets to use it and to be in the company of the great coaches' spirits now living in this gift. Thank you very much for being here. I, uh, I told you she was a very special lady, but I didn't know she was a poet. But wasn't that amazing? I have just one more introduction. And uh, it's... it's Pleasing to me, because I was here before uh, the women had any role, really, in the athletic department at all. And now we're just fully populated with women's crew and coaches. And my last introduction is of Julie Serrero, who is the director of athletics and the head of DAPER. And I've asked Julie to say a few words, and then we might uh, do something with this bottle of champagne. Julie? for 20 some years. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, I'm not going to use this then. I'm afraid I'll drop it on my toe. Uh, my responsibility is to talk briefly about the value and the importance of donor support for rowing. So I'm going to divert from this wonderful celebration because I want to share some very exciting news and this is the first time it's been announced publicly. As you might be aware, we've been trying to raise money to renovate the boathouse. 
And as of last Friday, we have met and surpassed our goal so that we are going to move into the planning stages of renovating this boathouse. So I know there's a lot of history, I know there's a lot of work in this, but we need a new boathouse. And it has happened, relating to what I'm to speak about, is because of the generosity of some of you here. So I take a moment to thank you for your supportive crew, and also thank you for your support in this special project that we are going to get going very soon. We will announce it more publicly in the upcoming weeks. We still have a lot of work to do. We need a timeline, we need more details to our plan, etc. We need permitting here on the river, but we are so excited about the potential of what we're going to do. We will rename the boathouse in honor of Dick Resch, who just donated a leadership gift about a week ago. So I'm very excited. I am, um, it's gonna be great. That's about what I'll, I'll say on that. So let me come back to this event. The person I wanna thank is Bob Vernon. If you want something done, call Bob, okay? He will twist your arm, he will beat you over the head, he will, he, he doesn't let go. I described him earlier as like a dog, just an alum, I said, he's like a dog with a boat. He's just gonna get it done, he's just gonna finish that boat, and he has done a great job. And Bob, we would not here, be here today if it wasn't for your dedication, perseverance, persistence, and just commitment to this event and this cause. So Bob, thank you very, very much. My name is Tommy, Bob even got me to gift. So you know he's very determined. So we're going to pour champagne, which is a typical thing we do with new shells, but we thought, why the heck not? Why not pour champagne on a, on a launch? So we have champagne. I'm going to ask the gentlemen who are standing before you to join me on this dock and we are going to pour champagne over the class of 63 coaches launch. So thank you so much, please. Can I make a brief announcement? Absolutely. This was, was going to be directed to Candace. Yes. And may it still be. Uh, I recommend you go to Amazon. Hopefully you can still buy a copy of a book titled Nice Row, MIT. <laughs> I happen to have a copy and have read it and okay. have passed mine on. All right. Uh, <laughs> The author is here with us today, Jack Lynch. That's the reason I'm not promoting this book. Oh, that's not, no, that's not part. In the book, there's a photograph of somebody, name unknown, painted red tea on the boathouse of that other school oh, up the river. I read that. And I, I bring that up only because I think this could use some renovation and you could use that book as a uh, as a model. I was aiming it at you because in your co-role as alumni giving and Department of Education, maybe you could get the funding from one to the other and not wait for the well, not wait not wait for the renovation. Well actually the, the new doc, new docks are planned as part of the renovation. But in the meantime buy some red thing. Buy some red paint. All right, let's move and pour the champagne. It'll be a wonderful opportunity. Thank you. They have been shredded. They, they, uh, the official times. Yeah. <laughs> 